When Jurgen Klopp and Pep Guardiola met for the first time, we had no idea it would be the birth of the finest managerial rivalry of the next decade. And they started as they meant to go on, with the crazy DFB Super Cup match ending 4-2 to Klopp's Dortmund, thanks to a Royce double, Gundogan and a Van Boyten on goal, whilst Robin was at the double for Pep's Bayern. But what was just as fascinating was the tactics, so today we'll take a look at them and you can see what's changed over the decade. And if you're watching this, you're probably a big football fan. And the perfect free football app for you is OneFootball, which you can download through the link in the description below. OneFootball is a football fan's dream, allowing you to follow your favourite clubs and players, letting you get the latest news, season stats, score updates, transfer rumours and so much more about them. And like I said, the best part is it's absolutely free and it helps to support the channel. So you can download it for free through the link in the description below. Here's how both managers lined up. And looking back at these lineups brings so many memories back. At Dortmund, you had a young core of Hummels, Gundogan, Royce and Lewandowski, whilst Bayern were oozing with class, with a young Alaba, Lahm, a consummate professional, a double pivot that Pep probably still dreams about, and Toni Kroos and Thiago. And let's not forget Arjen Robin running down the wings. But when you're looking at these formations, the first interesting thing to actually note is that Mandzukic did not play up front for most of the game. It was actually Shakiri who started up top and Mandzukic was out on the flanks, something that would see him do a lot of at Juventus later on in his career. We'll begin with Bayern in possession, and it should be noted that even though Bayern lost 4-2, they dominated the ball, so let's take a look at how they did that. And initially when Bayern had the ball, we know how much Klopp likes to press, and that was no different back then. So because the two centre-backs were the easy outlet options, Lewandowski would press, but he was joined by Gundogan, and these two were basically partners in crime throughout the match. So, at first, everybody was joining the press. But of course, Pep knew that this would likely be the situation, so they already had contingency plans in place. So how they overcame this pressure was through the use of a deep diamond. That involved Boateng and Van Boyten splitting really deep and wide, and Thiago coming to the tip of the diamond. So now the front two of Dortmund would be heavily outnumbered, as if these two looked to press the centre-backs, he had the open route to Thiago, and on the other hand, if any of them tried to cut out that route, using their cover shadow and looked to press Thiago, one of the centre-backs could create a passing angle there. And another one of the reasons that Pep's plans work so well, is that here, while the initial thought may be to commit an extra man in order to help prevent the progression, Bayern would potentially have the extra man in the midfield. And to make things worse, this is part of the reason why Shakiri started up front, because he could also drop in so that now there was a huge overload in the midfield. But it should also be noted that Hummels was very front foot whenever he was defending, so in open play and from goal kick situations, whenever we saw Shakiri drop in deep, he could follow. And this paid off in this match, however, we did see a lot of gaps appearing throughout the 90. One of the problems we did often see for Dortmund when Bayern had the build-up is that often they would initially be looking to cover their central options and once the ball went wide, one man would then come and press and Thiago could be found. A repeated pattern we'd see is Sven Bender looking to press. However, he was not on top of Thiago as he received the ball. So there would be some lag for him to get to the ball and by that point, the ball had been popped off to Tony Kroos who could now advance higher up the pitch and look for other teammates that he could make the pass into. So here's one of the situations that we talked about earlier. Dortmund are pressing with the front two of Gundogan and Lewandowski. And contrast this to Bayern Munich, who now have that deep diamond of theirs. So it's a four versus two situation. Run it on and Thiago is able to receive and Toni Kroos is now the free man in the midfield. And this is because initially Sahin and Bender were reluctant to completely press high up, as you'll see why as we roll on. Now Sahin looks to press Tony Kroos, but you can see his press has now come late, so Kroos has had time to receive and played around the corner to Shakiri, who is the extra man in the midfield, as he has dropped deep from centre forward as we discussed. And if Thiago is there, Kroos is there, and Shakiri is there, that means that Muller is also free in between the lines. And we can see he receives between the lines, this time it doesn't really come to much, but he could have turned if he wished to. And here, as I said, Hummels is also willing to press high up when the situation arises, but he's left a gap and you can see Schmelzer is now backpedaling. Alternatively, what we could also see if a man was on Thiago is that Tony Kroos could easily join into the build-up. 
so that he was an extra outlet option. Because again, the structure, with the extra man being the goalkeeper, meant that they could always find solutions in the center. Another situation where things play out similarly but slightly differently. In this case, one of the Dortmund midfielders, Bender, had carried on his press. But again, even with him joining the press, Bayern Munich have their deep diamond, their deep diamond sorted out. So they still have a 4 versus 3 advantage. So now Bender has retreated to be deeper, but again we still see Dortmund looking to press with their front two of Gundogan and Lewandowski. The difference is now, Toni Kroos has moved deeper, so Lewandowski may be looking to pick up Thiago, but Bayern have a free creator in Toni Kroos in space, again because of their numerical advantage. The Dortmund midfielder is looking to press, but Toni Kroos has already had time to turn and face the play. So this is dangerous for Dortmund because as we discussed, now we see Shakiri has dropped in from centre forward, he can receive and buy an away. But we should also note that it was not Manuel Neuer in goal for the Bavarians in this match, rather it was Stark. So he's obviously not as good with his feet as Neuer is. So one of the goals that Dortmund scored in fact came from a bit of pressure on Stark and then he looked to go long, but the ball was intercepted and with the Bayern defence still being disorganised, they were able to com combine out wide, leading to the goal. Stark is not as good with the ball at his feet. So we see here, under little pressure, he's actually kicked the ball straight to Gundogan, who does have a shot but it doesn't lead to much. But because the Bayern defence is still disorganised from the clearance, Lewandowski is here, half the team is playing an offside trap, but Van Boyten had been looking for the pass from Stark, so Lewandowski is onside, and he can receive the ball, play it in, and eventually we see the cross to the back post and Marco Royce finishes off the second ball. So again, in open play we had a similar situation, Bayern looking to build with the ball and Dortmund looking to press high. Again, the two partners in crime Lewandowski and Gundogan would be looking to press. But to this there was a simple solution, in that we saw Thiago often looking to drop in to create a 3 versus 2 so that now they had the advantage here and could play out. So, if the Dortmund pivots were staying deep, this was often by finding Toni Kroos, who would have moved out deep and to the left-hand side, which he still does a lot of at Real Madrid, as we've seen. If he was covered, Müller could also drop deep, but that would likely mean that Sven Bender would also come into the press. And again, this might be part of the reason why Shakiri was played up front, because now he would often drop into the midfield. So these often lined up as you'd see three traditional centre midfielders, and they're up against a double pivot. And at these points, we'd often see Mandzukic beginning to drift in central, David Alaba moving higher up. So we could see there were plenty of options here to play into the midfield for Bayern. So here's another situation we see in the build-up. Because Bayern know that Dortmund are going to be pressing with their front two, Thiago has dropped in to create this 3 versus 2 in the first phase. Now Dortmund are looking to press, and Gundogan was pressing as a forward, so he doesn't really count as part of the midfield. And contrast this to Bayern who have three men in Muller, Toni Kroos and Shakiri again from centre forward has all the freedom he needs to drop into a good position. Again something that we would see is the proactivity of Hummel. So at times when Shakiri did drop in to become the extra man, Hummels was willing to come all the way out here in order to keep pressure on him. Again it paid off in this match but there were lots of big holes left in the defence, which is a situation that is not ideal. So this is where we saw a first victory for Pep where Klopp actually conceded and Dortmund, who at this time were some of the highest pressers in Europe, decided to fall back a little. So with Bender and Nuri Sahin now playing deeper, if Lewandowski and Gundogan had kept on pressing higher up the pitch, the double pivot here would have been in acres of space. So what we saw was Gundogan and Lewandowski looking to drop deeper in order to cover the pivots. This led to a whole host of other problems for Dortmund though, and this is because Jerome Boateng was crucial with the ball in being very proactive and looking to drive forward. So we would often see him moving higher, hopefully with the ball, <laughs> into this position. At the same time, his partners down the flank would have moved higher up. So although this looks like a 2 versus 2 here, Dortmund didn't want Boateng moving all the way up the pitch, so this could leave Blas so this could leave Blaschikowski in two minds. If he moved towards Boateng, a man was free out here, but if he stayed deep, Boateng could keep driving forward. So this was actually often a 3 versus 2 here, which could lead to many interesting situations. At times when Blaschikowski did decide to stay much deeper, Boateng would drive more central, and this would draw in Nuri Sahin. So as discussed with Shakiri moving deep, Muller there as well, this would open up space in the midfield either directly 
or Bayern could first work the ball around the back to then find men in this vacated space. Here with an interesting situation, as you can see Dortmund is not pressing nearly as high, so Boateng was able to drive up the pitch, and though Gundogan looks like he's pressing, he's joined in fairly late. So Boateng has brought the ball up into a good position. So now Sahin is dragged into the press from the midfield here. And though it looks like they have the situation under control, we can see that Bayern can play the ball back Nuri Sahin over here is still out of position compared to where he would have been if he wasn't looking to track Boateng. And again, Shakiri dropping in from the midfield now has space to receive a penetrative pass. Okay, here we have a similar situation. Gundogan and Lewandowski, the front two, are not pressing. They were more worried about this situation. So now we begin to see Boateng looking to move high up. So now, Kuba in this position in right wing is torn between two options. Does he go and press Boateng or does he keep his eye on Alaba behind him? And we can see what he chooses to do here. He had his eye on Boateng so the penetrative pass came through to Robin and now on the outside Alaba has space to attack with no man marking him, leading to a potentially dangerous situation. And in the first half in particular, Pep was looking to get men between the lines and this was especially in the shape of the dropping Shakiri as well as Thomas Muller because if these men were pushing higher up, penetrative passing either from a centre-back or if Thiago had dropped deep or Tony Kroos, who we know is an excellent passer, could allow these two to combine in these regions. So we can see that this central overload was a big part of Bayern's game and this only got stronger in the second half but we'll come on to that later. The contrast in how the flanks were used is also interesting. Iron Robin is a 1 vs 1 player, so isolating him against Schmalzer would have been the ideal situation for Bayern Munich. On the other hand, Mandzukic isn't even really a winger, so getting him 1 vs 1 was not really useful. So what we often saw was that out on the right hand side Robin would hug the touchline. Mandzukic come in central, again this would serve to increase the central overload and his presence here would make it more difficult for a centre back to look and back up the press. In the first half this then had a knock on effect on the behaviours of the two, two fullbacks. As we know, Alaba is happy to go forward all day long, especially back then. So he could provide all the width on the left hand side, and working the ball to him would be an ideal situation. Lam, particularly in the first half, this was going to change in the second half, which was a game changer for Bayern, but in the first half he preferred to stay much deeper. So here's the first half example of the general Bayern Munich shape. Jordan Shakiri is dropping into the midfield alongside Toni Kroos and Thomas Müller who is higher up the pitch. At the same time Thiago is there so they already have 5 men just in the central region. We also see the contrast in how the full backs are used. Because Mandzukic has drifted centrally, Alaba can provide all the width needed and Lam on the other hand is playing much more defensive. And this is because Robin is choosing to hug the flank so that if a switch does come he can be 1 vs 1 with Schmelzer because in this situation Muller is actually moving in field. And running the play on, we can see that Robin is still looking to provide all the width out wide. Lam is still deep on the pitch, so now when the switch comes across, Robin will have a 1 vs 1 as Schmelzer will be the one to go across to him. Boateng of the centre backs was the ball playing centre back, who, as discussed, would look to drive up forward with the ball. So, a big component of the left hand side was creating overloads out here. And this is because, hopefully, the ideal scenario would either to be to find Muller or Shakiri with space between the lines or Alaba was excellent with his left foot at trying to get crosses into the box and Mandzukic was often the target as he had now moved central. Here we see the situation. Bayern are looking to overload the left hand side of the pitch. That's five players here and Boateng is out here as well. Contrast this to the far side where Robin is just waiting for the switch so that he can be isolated against his man. And that eventually does come when Boateng receives the ball back, as when the switch comes, Robin is now in a good position. But Schmelzer was great in this game at being touch tight to Robin, so the ball hasn't even arrived. Robin now already has his back to goal, so he'll be forced backwards towards Lam. What we did occasionally see was that Lam, even from this deeper pocket, would be able to receive in a little bit more space. And it appears that the back post here with Grosskreutz out at right back was an area that Pep was looking to target as he was always looking for crosses to the back post where Mandzukic would have a big overload against Grosskreutz and have a good chance to get a header on target. So Bayern was somewhat struggling in the first half, so Pep looked to adapt in the second half. His first move was moving Mandzukic back to his preferred centre forward role. 
and the instinct would be to keep Robin out on his preferred right hand side and move Shakiri out wide here. But instead, Pep moves Shakiri to the right and in a rare instance, we saw Robin playing down the left hand side. So this is because there's a contrast between Shakiri and Robin, both left footed wingers, but the difference is when Robin is out here, he likes to take on his man and get to the byline for a cross, but we all know his favourite move is coming in here and have a shot. On the other hand, Shakiri doesn't have as much pace or as much trickery, so he's more of an on the ball winger, so he would be happy to drift in central on this side. And instead of getting Robin to hug the left hand side, Pep also instructed him to come in central. So you can see that central overload that we spoke about has now been exacerbated. This would force Dortmund to collapse in on themselves to keep themselves compact and prevent any combination play in the centre. So now all the space is out on the flanks and Alaba, as we know, loves pushing high up and now Lam was unlocked in the second half. So now with a more effective central overload as they had the extra man in here, space opened up, particularly on the right hand side. So Bayern could now often find Lam, who in the first half was mainly hanging back, and he could often get crosses in. And again, there was that back post weakness of Grosskreutz that Pep was still targeting and Robin was able to come in on the back post and score two goals, as we'll see. So this is the second half now, and you can see Robin is now playing off the left hand side, Mandzukic up front, and Shakiri has moved over to the right. But what's important is Shakiri is not really looking to hug the flank. Instead, his first movement is inside to help the overload. So, what that means is where before Lam was playing fairly conservatively, looking to provide a passing option backwards, now he has all this room to exploit down the right hand side. So this situation actually leads to a goal for Bayern Munich. Shakiri again is playing infield and we have Robin playing off the left hand side. This means that Schmelzer is all the way infield, so all the room is out on the flank. This means that Schmelzer is all the way infield, so there's a lot of room out here for Lam to, to operate in. From here, Lam is able to get his cross in, and again, there was a problem with Grosskreutz at the back post, so it's Robin who actually gets a headed goal from the far side from the Lam cross, who's now able to go higher up. This situation is slightly different. Again, Robin off the left, Shakiri off the right hand side. But because Lam knows that Shakiri isn't just going to look to hug the touchline and will in all likelihood look to cut in, he's much more confident in looking to move down the flanks to overlap his man. So now Lam is able to overlap Shakiri and get his cross in, and guess who it is who gets the second goal again? Robin coming in off the left hand side. But the build up shape for Bayern Munich often led to interesting situations in the transition. As we know, down the left hand side, Bayern were looking for overload. So if the ball did break down here and Dortmund were able to make an interception, they had so many numbers around the ball who could quickly create pressure and this often led to Dortmund turnovers as they would usually kick the ball straight out of play. This wasn't helped by the fact that Gundogan was staying high up the pitch so they had one less number in the midfield. Here we can see why the Bayern counterpress was so effective. Again, they have an overload on the far side. So the ball actually does break down as Kroos misplaces the pass. But as soon as Dortmund look to get back in the play, Bayern are already collapsing around the ball. So in this situation, they're able to win the ball back within two seconds. But we can also see that Bayern had to play with a ridiculously high line. So if the ball did break down, Dortmund had willing runners who were ready to commit so they could get into the space if they did manage to get their head up. If the ball did break down, Dortmund had willing runners, especially down this right hand side, where Alaba, who would be high either attacking or was very front foot when looking to press, meant that he would often leave gaps in this area that Dortmund could look to attack and try and exploit. So here again we have an interesting situation. David Alaba is pushing high up on the left compared to Lam, and this was part of the Bayern Munich game plan as we've discussed. So Boateng is gonna lump it long, but then there's a turnover and Dortmund get the ball back. But now when the ball does come back, Alaba is still high and now out of position. So there is an opportunity for Dortmund with their 2 versus 1 in these situations to look and exploit the space. As Boateng now has to move forward, so the ball is going to be played into Lewandowski who is making the run into the space in behind, though it doesn't lead to anything. And with Bayern so heavily overloaded to the left hand side, the space was down Dortmund's own left. So in these situations, if they avoided the initial counter press and were able to get out towards the left hand side, Dortmund time and again had space to transition into. And this is where a lot of their dangerous play came down. 
especially through Royce, who could start from out to in down this left-hand side, or Gundogan, who would also often find space if he was the first pass. This is where the Dortmund transition tended to be so dangerous, because Bayern primarily attacked down the left-hand side. So when the ball broke down, if they were able to work the ball quickly away from this side, towards Royce and often Gundogan down the left-hand side, that's where the space would be in the midfield. Here's another situation, Bayern were again pressing down the left-hand side. And when the ball breaks, Bayern are still overcommitted towards this left-hand side, meaning that all the space for Dortmund is here with Gundogan and Royce if they're able to work it through, which they are. So now between Royce and Gundogan, they have all of the space to play with down their left-hand side because Bayern were overloading that left-hand side. Bayern were much more effective in putting pressure, so Dortmund weren't really looking to play out from the goalkeeper. But in open play, what Bayern did when they were pressing, again, is committing two men. But Dortmund did not have as technical of players, so they weren't willing to take the risks to play out in these tighter situations, especially as Weidenfeller couldn't be the extra man, as he's not that good on the ball. So what we would see in these situations, with Bayern also shifting to a two, is that the centre-backs would usually be forced to one of the full-backs, as Bayern's pivots were backing up the press. So, if this was out to Schmelzer, this would now create the opportunity for pressure from wide, at which point the Bayern forwards would also be cutting out the central options. So Bayern had effectively boxed Dortmund into one side of the pitch. This was slightly different down the right-hand side, as Mandzukic, as a natural centre-forward, wasn't as disciplined when it comes to tracking back. So we would often see him being drawn up higher and more central, and Grosskreutz down the outside could receive a more direct pass from the centre-back and look to progress. This could also work for Bayern sometimes as it could be a press to force Grosskreutz into this isolated position, where Bayern could then collapse around him. But Dortmund also had some similar ideas in the attack. Lewandowski would occupy the two centre-backs, and Gundogan from his attacking midfield position often drifted left. Grosskreutz tended to stay deeper because Kubler likes to hug the touchline, so he was less likely to drift infield, so he could hold this position. On the other hand, Schmalzer is a highly attacking fullback who liked to get up the pitch and could provide the width. This fit in with Royce because where Kubler was right-footed on the right-hand side, so liked to attack this byline, Royce was right-footed on the left-hand side, and Natria li liked to drift into these areas where he could create, but also have shots on goal. So we often saw these two men here up the pitch. This was also helped by the fact that Hummels is an excellent ball playing centre back, so he could push high up into this situation and he was genuinely as good as, a, as good as a playmaker at times. So one of these men could make the run in behind and look to receive the chip ball perfectly weighted from Hummels into good situations. This is where we saw Dortmund have success as they could also overload the left hand side. So here we have Hummels on the ball was happy to drive down the flanks. Schmelzer out wide drawing Lahm, and both Gundogan and Marco Royce would look to occupy these spaces here. Hubbles has an excellent pass on him, so he could look for a ball or even a chip ball over the top to the run of either Gundogan or Marco Royce, which consistently led to Dortmund getting into good positions because now they have a 3 versus 1. Overall, this first match actually gave us insight into the future, as this is a common pattern that we've seen with Pep's teams dominating possession, but Klopp hitting on the transition dangerously. But what did you think of this match, if you still remember it? Are there any other classic matches you want to see me break down? And of course, I have to give a special thanks to my patrons, whose contributions have helped me to reinvest in the channel by getting new software and hardware in order to help make the channel better. So, thank you.